archives of Prasar Bharti presents the timeless treasure of golden era. In 1953, Dobi Ghazameen, directed by Bimal Roy, captured the attention of film goers the world over. This was some two years before Shatrijit Rai's Pathet Panchali was released. Dobi Ghazameen was a sensitive film, inspired by the neorealistic tradition of European cinema, and it went on to become a landmark in Indian cinema. And in its wake, it established the reputation of its director, Bimal Roy, as one of the major talents of the Indian film industry. In a career that spanned almost 25 years, Bimal Roy made most of his films within the demanding commercial environment of the Bombay film industry. But even though he made concessions to the demands of the box office, he never abandoned his poetic sensibilities. I think there is a part of him in all the films that he made. There was a light of a lot of insight to the man. In his films, he had the same melancholic, poetic approach towards his subject. Uh, he was always uh, preoccupied, almost obsessed by his work. Born in East Bengal, now Bangladesh, Bimal Roy came from a Zamindar's family. Having left the ancestral land, he chose to come to Calcutta to make his profession in the film industry. Like countless technicians before him, he was groomed in the new theatres of Calcutta under the benign patronage of B.N. Shorkar. He became a sensitive cameraman and photographed some important films made by P.C. Borua for the new theatres, including the early Devdas starring K.L. Sahgal. There were write-ups in papers about his ability and he was called ace cameraman of India at that time. He was pretty young, but he had made a name for himself. But after he spoke to me in Sarkar, he, he spoke to me. He said, well, I do want to make direct films. And uh, Mr. Sarkar has asked me to look for some subjects. And I also read some books. And uh, Mr. Sarkar had said, uh, ask her to translate some of them and from English, naturally English books, the classics. Ultimately, he selected his own subject. He read Udhar Pathe. There was another subject written by Perman Mitra. There were two subjects he had thought of. But he ultimately, he selected Udhar Pathe and made it. The young director's concern for social realism was evident in Udhar Pathe, which he made in 1944. It was a courageous break from the escapism of the Bengali cinema of the time. Udayar Pothe went on to become a cult film in Bengal. It was a, one of those films that suddenly explode. It was a, almost, I can't use any other word. It was really exploded in entire West Bengal. The time was ripe for such a kind of film. And the younger generation took to it like, you know, they, they got something after their heart. And they were just almost the I, how can I say, they stormed the theatres and there was nothing else but talk about Udhar Bhate, that, that kind of thing. I've never seen anything like this. Bima Roy directed a number of films for new theatres and like many of his contemporaries, he eventually left them to branch out on his own. He was a part of a very excellent uh, um, uh, aesthetic uh, um, setup in new theatres. And he could see the disintegration of new theatres at the increasing demands that are there at the box office. And eventually he had to, he reluctantly came to Bombay, quite reluctantly. His reputation secure in Bengal, Bimal Roy came to Bombay to direct Ma for Bombay Talkies and then accepted an offer from Ashok Kumar to direct Parinita. The film starred Meena Kumari and Ashok Kumar. The soft-spoken director who came for a brief visit ended up staying in Bombay for the rest of his life. He gradually imported his own people. I mean, he had come with his whole unit, but then Ashali Chaudhary who had written though because I mean, he joined, like that, so many others had joined. And they all thought of making a film under his own banner, create a banner, Bimala Productions, which was created. 
In 1952, the first international film festival held in Bombay introduced Indian filmmakers and film buffs to the best of world cinema. The exposure to some of these classics was to have a lasting influence on the subsequent films of many Indian film directors. That time, you know, the festivals were there, Bicycle Thief was shown, Rashomon, all these films were shown. So one day I had a uh, frank uh, talk with him. I said, I, you are like my father, I hold in your highest esteem. Hmm. Are we going to go on making this film all through our lives? He said, Dishi, what can we do? I said, well, why can't you make a film like this? He said, you, you get a story. So Sharil, this film was being made in Bengali, called Rikshawala. So I told him there is a story like this. He said, these are three short stories it looks like. I said, it can be joined into one page. He said, write a script then, write in six or eight pages. I wrote it in 24 pages, and I narrated it to him. And he made it. And I knew it is so easy to write or visualize a film, to make how difficult it is, I realized when I, he told me, you will, will be assisting me in this film as my chief assistant. But since he was a cameraman, well, I learned almost all film making from that film from him. Dobi Kazameen was the story of a farmer, driven off his land by debt, who comes to Calcutta to work as a rickshaw puller, to buy his land back. The documentary realism and the emotional undercurrents of the film brought vividly to the Indian screen a reality and intensity previously unseen. Dobi Kazameen was more than just a cinematic experience for the film goer. It was shot entirely in outdoor, and it was so difficult. How you can shoot a scene in Howrah Station or near the Howrah Bridge with two artists, you know, almost getting run over by a tram, things like that. He taught then how it can be done, and I'm talking about 1952. Papu, what is so you had to have a dummy camera, take a glamour of zero in, in a rickshaw, put that dummy camera on there. And he used to teach Balaraj what is to be done. And a man used to stand with a wrapper around him and with a hand-nailed camera. And suddenly, the scene used to be enacted and the film used to be shot without knowledge of anybody. And you see those scenes, you'd be amazed to see that nobody watched it. And I learned from him. And I used to tell him, how did you think of this? This can be done in this way. He said, if you are a progressive, your path is not very smooth. You have to devise means and ways of how to shoot a scene, how to do it. Dobi Ghazameen was made memorable by brilliant casting and the director's intuitive belief in Balraj Sahani's ability to play the farmer turned rickshaw The choice of uh, Balraj Sahani created a lot of uh, criticism because he was, looked very much a kind of Western person, his looks a bit. So playing a Kisan was not, it was a very difficult um, selection for my husband to make, but somehow he had decided that he would be able to play the role. And also Nirupa Roy, who had been playing film goddesses to make her suddenly a uh, Kisan's wife with tattered clothes. That also people thought it was a wrong kind of choice. But he was always right in his subject, choosing his people or the actors, actresses. But it was in the depiction of the dramatic scenes that the film achieved a realistic texture which transcended the illusion of mere cinema. When Bharadaj is pulling the rickshaw, a boy playfully chases a girl and tells Bharadaj Shani to go faster, to move faster, and there is a horse carriage, a hackney carriage going, you know, so cut of the shot of the horse roofs, the sound is overlapped on the feet of that barefooted man, and um, he's whipping the horse, and the fellow is um, whipping a um, handkerchief, so you know, that sound overlap on the whip, that sequence, I thought was very poor. Though Big Hazameen received international accolades, Bimal Roy accompanied the film to Russia, along with Balraj Sahani and Mirupa Roy, as part of an Indian film delegation.
film was received with great enthusiasm in the Soviet Union and then in China as well. He was a terribly socially aware man. What do you think there was a certain restriction which we all had when we came to Mumbai? How to survive, how to survive. But he was absolutely socially committed. He had never taken a theme which is reactionary in nature. Following the success of Dobi Ghazameen, and partly because of it, Bimal Roy made Nokri, starring Kishore Kumar. The film was a commercial disaster. For his next venture, he chose to remake Dev Das. He had been the cinematographer in the earlier version, directed by P.C. Borwa. I do not know what prompted him to pick up this subject. We met and he asked me if I would do it, because he said that if you do it, then I'd make it. Initially, it was Nargis and uh, Meena Kumari who were to play Chandramukhi and Parvati. But then something transpired or something did not transpire and these artists were not available and then uh, he shifted on to the new casting. Um, I wanted to see what was done before in Devdas, but he didn't encourage me to see the previous Devdas. He said, you Subhai, you don't see it. For cinema lovers, Bimal Roy's Devdas remains one of the most accomplished and faithful renditions of the Sharat Chandra classic. It is remembered to this day for stunning performances by its stars, Vijayanti Mala, Shuchitra Shen and Dilip Kumar. Devdas was a very rewarding experience. It had a a creative man who tried to transplant it onto the celluloid with a great measure of accuracy. But it was the director's eye for the significant details of the period and the understated emotional choreography which enhanced the impact. Devdas was also responsible for the confirmation of Dilip Kumar as the king of tragedy in Hindi cinema. The critics always uh, was very uh, critical about my husband trying to make a film like Madhumati who had given though because I mean why should a man like that make Madhumati? That reminds me of Shatyajit Babu. Once he said in Bengali, naturally in Bengali, he said the Amrata actor is John Mo. We could say Bulun actor so we actor come bana bocano. Nana rock me to call a wujit na ja it said I could whatever I like, I must do that. Why should I stick to one formula? I don't like that. People uh, praise uh, Raj Kapoor, Guru Dutt especially, that these are masters of song pictureization. But Bemal Das, I think pictureization of Madhumati songs will beat everybody hollow. The way he conceived Ajare Pardesi and uh, Suhana Safar, pictureization of these songs, I think it is, it is the last word in song pictureization. Although he himself was not much of a music man, so to say, but his sense of uh, rhythm, sense of cutting, sense of short division, you know, from extreme long shot to biggest close-up, all these things, he was a great master. He had the, the habit of inviting uh, the unit members Nobindu Babu was there, Ashit was there, and then Muni was there, uh, Rishikesh was there, and they would all sit around and discuss uh, the need for a, a song, how it is to be introduced with the least, least bit of intrusion, then, uh, and the need for action, if any. That film Madhumati was uh, the result of these uh, various combinations and considerations, an element of thrill in it, and uh, with a uh, good lot of music pushed into it. And music that's not all just melancholic, but uh, there is a bright strain. But even to Bimalda's bright strains, there was a sense of melancholy. In Madhumati, despite major concessions to the box office, Bimal Roy kept tight control over this absorbing mystery about reincarnation. It was written by Ritya Ghatak. The haunting music of the film ensured its commercial success. But it was in the engagingly simple narrative structure, without distracting flourishes, where the director's style was evident. I personally feel 
Madhumati was made for, for survival. Because after Madhumati, he had all these artists, I mean, who used to love him dearly, say, Dilip Kumar, Vajanti Mala, all of them. But what did he make after Madhumati? He made, say, Sujata, Bandini, films like that. Throughout his career, Bimal Roy grappled with the pressures of the box office. However, he never lost track of his primary concerns, and the best films he directed were those where his social beliefs dovetailed into humanistic sentimental stories. Sujata remains one of his most popular films. The nature of untouchability was brought home in an unstrident and compassionate manner. Once again, the director tells the tale simply and with great tenderness. Milda sort of believed more in uh, eye expressions, more in silence, more in uh, sort of uh, little gestures of the face, maybe like biting of a lip or a flicker of an eye, like a twitch of a, a, a lip or a cheek or some, something which sort of gave the right uh, mood and the right feeling of that particular uh, um, scene. And uh, he believed a lot in uh, holding the shot silent, but he had a terrific sense of timing. I mean, he wouldn't hold it unnecessarily just to make an impact or just to sort of let it seem like a gimmick. He would come to his artists for example, he would come to me and very quietly, I mean, hardly under his breath, he would say, Nathan, this is this, this is this, this is the scene, this is the mood I want, and uh, this is how I would like you to do it. And you know, you know the rest, you know, I mean, he, he'd, he'd know that I'd sort of grasped it and I'd give it to him exactly the way he wanted. And so I'd give him a rehearsal and I'd say, Dada, I'll, I'll do it a little better in the take because I, I'm basically I'm a take artist, you see, and I don't want to give my full, um, all my 100% of uh, acting in the rehearsals because I, I feel I'll lose the spontaneity when I'm doing the take. So, uh, and he knew that too. So uh, we'd uh, sort of rehearse a little roughly and then finally he'd get exactly what he wanted. He was, I would say, that one of the quietest men on the set. Even the uh, process of his shooting was very quiet. There wasn't the hustle and bustle that you see in a studio. Uh, the lighting men would address to each other in soft whispers. And they could be heard because there was a general quietitude. Sujata had a lot of uh, lovely songs, lots of them. In fact, the whole music was so beautiful. Um, but one of the very lovely songs is Kali Ghata Chai, Murajiya Lala Chai. The other one was uh, sung by Talat Mahmood, was uh, Jalte Hain Jiski Liye, which was picturized on Mr. Sunil Dad. There is a little simple child in him. He would sit in a quiet place and watch birds. And uh, he was, of course, very fond of photography. There was a a bit of that uh, simple uh, rural fascination for the rural scene for him and uh, that's a part of that's a part of his personality i think he was not a urban man in the in that sense of the word for a man who found self expression primarily through motion pictures bimal roy's first love was still photography his portfolio of photographs reveals a camera eye which has the same deceptively quiet quality of his cinema. It was understandable that the Bombay film industry held him in such high esteem, not just as a craftsman and a technician, but also as a genuine poet of the Indian cinema. He always said, I haven't learned anything. I'm a very ordinary person. I don't profess to being a superman or very intelligent, highly, a, what you call the intellectual. He said, he didn't like the word. He said, I'm not an intellectual. I'll do what I like and what maybe people like. Simple, simple subjects, simple stories. As a director who popularized social realism on the Hindi screen, Bimal Roy was constantly battling trends and stereotypes. In Bandini, he took up another woman-oriented subject, this time that of a murderess, 
The film charts her physical and psychological rehabilitation. Somebody asked him, Bimalda, your films are great, but uh, a little speed is needed, you know. So Bimalda gave a wonderful reply. Do you think that life is a continuous race course where horses are all the time running? Life is like that. It has its, you see, moments of uh, speed, high speed. At the same time again, one walks, one sits, one sits to ponder. See? So I take life in totality. In most of his films, uh, there were very, very difficult scenes, extremely difficult scenes. I'll give you a scene from Bandini where uh, my character, Kalyani, is contemplating to murder the, the woman whom she eventually murders. Uh, that was the scene. It was entirely a director's scene, although I, 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 it looked as if I did a lot of good acting in that. But uh, thanks to Bimalda, uh, the, the way he took the shots, it's where she's uh, sitting all alone in her room. And uh, she's really fighting mentally what to do, whether to do it or not to do it, whether to kill this woman or not to kill this woman. And Bimilda gave an effect of a welding going on next door to this particular house or room. And uh, he just gave flashes of those welding uh, lights, you know. I think it, it was such a beautiful effect. It, it gave the mental condition of this girl, this Kalyani, uh, in, in this kind of a situation. The distributors always wanted a happy ending and they wanted the romantic couple to be together and uh, towards the end unite and all that sort of thing. And of course there were suggestions by a few people that uh, Kalyani's character should go back to uh, the younger boy, that is Dharminder, and not to uh, Dada Muni, not to Ashok Kumar, um, because Ashok Kumar was supposed to be a much older person in that film. Uh, but uh, Bimalda was absolutely certain of what he wanted, because uh, the, the whole essence of that story was that she, she had been in love with uh, the older, older man. And ultimately, I mean, she even murdered this woman who happened to be the older man's wife because this older man was very, very uh, unhappy. And I thought it was obvious that she had to go just to the older man. There was no question about it. Bimal Roy always claimed that his films were for the common man. It is their accessibility which give his films their eternal charm. And he also embellished his most intense films with memorable songs. Barman Dada's music was so beautiful. Uh, a very, very peculiar thing of that song was its rhythm. It had a very peculiar rhythm. And um, it, it sort of uh, went like this. Uh. <laughs> By the end of his career, Bimal Roy found himself at variance with the changing tastes of the Indian audiences and the distributors' demands for more commercialized films. He was also in poor health. His death from cancer in 1968 was premature. He left behind a number of incomplete scripts and film ideas which he was working on. And with his death, a golden period of Hindi cinema came to an end. For it was never again to capture that certain blend of innocence, cinematic quality, and narrative skill. That unique mixture of art, commerce, and entertainment. <laughs>